Book Four, Chapter Twenty Eight of Amadis of Gaul. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Lobera. Translated by Robert Southey. Book Four, Chapter Twenty Eight. How the Emperor of Rome and King Lisuarte went with all their force towards the firm island to seek their enemies. The history saith that the Emperor of Rome and King Lisuarte broke up their camp before Windsor, and set forth with all that company whereof you have heard. They resolved to proceed leisurely, that their men and horses might be fresh at the meeting. So the first day they proceeded only three leagues, and at this pace they continued their progress, till they learned that King Perion was on his way to meet them, and was then only two days' journey distant. Incontinently, King Lisuarte commanded Ladacin, the cousin of Don Guillaume the Pensive, to take fifty knights and keep three leagues before the army. He, on the third day, fell in with the advanced guard of King Perion, forty knights led by Enil, and sent forward for the same precaution. Both parties then stopped and sent each the tidings, not daring to come to an encounter, for that had been forbidden them. The two armies continued to advance, and were now within half a league of each other upon a great and wide plain. In either army there were many knights skilful in war, that neither in this respect could boast of much advantage over the other, and it seemed as if by common accord they set about fortifying their camp with ditches and other means of defence, in case they should need such helps in retreat. While the armies were thus employed, Gandalin arrived, who had taken Melissia to the firm island, and had since hastened with his utmost speed to come up before the battle. The reason was this. You know that Gandalin was the son of the good knight Don Gandales, and the milk-brother of Amadis. From the day on which Amadis, then calling himself the child of the sea, was made a knight, he knew that they were not brothers, though till then they had ever thought themselves such, and from that hour Gandalin had always attended him as his squire. Now, though he had often besought his master to make him a knight, yet Amadis could never have resolution to do that, which by reason he ought to have done, and to which he was greatly bound, for his father's sake who fostered him, and for his own being the best squire that ever served a knight. Yet, because Gandalin knew the secret of his love, and was his only comforter, and the only one with whom he could talk about Oriana, he could not bear to lose him, as he must have done had he knighted him. For then Gandalin must needs have gone his way to seek adventures, and gain the praise of prowess. But now that Amadis had his lady Oriana in his power, and was resolved not to part with her, except he lost his life, Gandalin knew that he might reasonably demand knighthood, more especially on so great and signal an occasion as this battle. For greatly as he desired it, he had never much urged the point, knowing how necessary he was to his master. So having now delivered the bidding of Queen Elisina, and related his tidings, he took him aside and said, "'The reason, sir, why I have so long ceased to ask knighthood at your hand, with that earnestness which would have become me, has been my great desire to serve you.' and my knowledge how necessary I was to your comfort. For this reason I have forborne to act as became my good birth, and suffered my honour to be neglected. But now, sir, that she for whom you have endured so much is in your power, there is no excuse either to satisfy myself or others why I should longer forbear to seek the order of knighthood. Now I beseech you, give it me, for you know otherwise what shame and lasting dishonour it will be to me if it be now withheld. When Amadis heard him speak thus, he was so troubled that for a while he could not reply. At length he said, O oh, my true friend and brother, it is as grievous for me to fulfil what you require as though my heart were plucked from my body, and if with any reason I could dissuade you, I would strive with all my might so to do but your demand is so just that it cannot be denied, and I am grieved that I did not provide such arms and horse for the occasion as you deserve. Then Gandalin knelt down to kiss his hand, but Amadis, 
raised him and embraced him and wept over him to think of the solitude he should endure for his loss sir quoth gandalin don galaor in his great courtesy knowing my desire hath given me his horse and arms of which he said he had no need in this malady i thanked him and took the horse which is a good one and the breastplate and helmet but not the other arms for they ought to be what beseem a young knight and those therefore i had made while i remained with him he offered me his sword also but i told him sir that you would give me one of those which queen menorisa gave you in greece since it is so replied amadis do you watch your arms the night before the battle in the chapel of my father's tent and in the morning when we are about to encounter the enemies the king my father shall knight thee you know that no better man can be found nor one from whose hand you could receive more honour in the ceremony sir quoth gandalin what you say is true it would be hard to find another knight like the king but i will receive knighthood from no hand but yours lasindo don bruneo's squire has told me that his master has promised to knight him and we two will watch our arms together god grant that i may fulfil the duties of knighthood and manifest the teaching which i have from you received two days did the armies remain within sight of each other fortifying their camps and preparing all things for the battle on the second day at evening the spies of king aravigo arrived at the top of the mountains and from thence beheld how both hosts were encamped below when king aravigo and the other leaders heard this they sent their scouts back to observe all that should pass and they themselves took possession of all the passes of the shearer and so stationed themselves that if need were they could with little danger retreat by the mountains to the sea and there embark but their doings had not been so secret that king lisuarte had not heard how so great an army had landed in his dominions and though he knew not to what end they came nor whitherward they marched he had given orders to secure all the stalls and drive away all the cattle thereabout and that the peasantry should go to the fortified towns and he had left certain knights to defend them king perion also had heard of them and was alarmed at the tidings but neither did he know where they now were thus had they put both parties in fear now had they remained three days and the emperor patin became impatient of longer delay desirous either vanquished or victor to return to his own country amadis also and agrayas and don quadragante and the other knights besought perion to come to battle that god might decide the cause the king was as desirous as they but had delayed thus long that all things might be ready he now made proclamation that all should hear mass at dawn and arm themselves and every man then repair to his own captain for the battle would be waged the same order was issued in the other camp so when the dawn appeared the trumpets sounded so loud and clear that they were heard in both camps as though they had been in concert the knights began to arm and saddle their horses and they heard mass in the tents and mounted and each went to his proper standard who is he that hath such thought and memory though he had seen this sight and given it all his attention that he could relate or write of the arms and horses with their devices and the knights who were there embattled certes the man would be a fool and devoid of understanding who could think to do this leaving therefore the general description something shall be said here of the particular and we will begin with the emperor of rome who was strong of body and courageous and would have been a right good knight if his little discretion and great pride had not marred him his armour was all black helmet and shield and surcoat except that on the shield he bore the figure of a damsel from her girdle upward made to the likeness of oriana well wrought in gold and garnished with pearls and precious stones and fastened to the shield with nails of gold and on his black surcoat he had a golden chain-work woven which device he swore never to lay aside till he had amadis in chains and all those who had been with him at the rescue of oriana he was on a goodly horse and of great size and his lance in his hand and thus he rode out of the camp next after him came floyan 
the brother of Celestonquidio. He bore for his arms black and yellow quartered, and nothing more. He was a good knight, and greatly esteemed by his own party. Arquisil was behind him, bearing arms of azure and argent powdered with roses of gold. The arms of Lisuarte were black with white eagles, and he bore one eagle on his shield without any adornment. But those arms came out of the field with great honour by reason of what their lord did therein. King Kildadan appeared in arms that were entirely black, for, from the time of his defeat in the Battle of the Hundred, whereby his kingdom became tributary to King Lisuarte, he had never worn others. I shall not tell you what arms King Gasquilan of Sweden bore till another time. King Arban of North Wales, and Don Guian the Pensive, and Don Grumadan would wear no arms for show that day, but only for use, that they might thus show the sorrow they had to behold the king their master placed in so great danger against those who had been in his service and in his household, and who had won for him such honour. Now we will tell you the arms of King Perion and the knight of the other host. The armour and the helmet and the shield of the king were all of burnished steel, and his surcoat was of silk of a bright and vivid colour. He rode a goodly steed, which his nephew Don Brian of Monjaste had given him, being one of twenty which the king his father had sent from Spain to distribute among the knights, and in this guise he advanced with the banner of the Emperor of Constantinople. Amadis was armed in green armour, such as he wore when he slew Famongomadan and Bazagante, his son, the two mightiest giants in the world. These arms were powdered with lion's ore. Amadis had much affection for them, because he assumed them on his departure from the poor rock, and had worn them when he went to Oriana at Miraflores. Don Quadragante wore murray arms with flowers argent, and rode one of the Spanish horses. Don Bruneo of Bonamar did not change his device, which was a damsel in his shield and a knight kneeling before her. Don Florestan, the good knight and jouster, bore gules with golden flowers and rode a Spanish horse. The arms of Agrias were rose colour, and in his shield was a damsel's hand holding a heart. The good Angriote wore his usual arms of azure and argent, and all the other knights of whom no mention is made that they who read this history may not be wearied, wore rich arms and of what colour they liked best. Thus they went forth into the field in good array, and when they were all assembled, each man under his leader, they advanced slowly on at the time of sunrise, and the morning shone upon their arms which were new and bright, and shone in such guise that it was marvellous to behold. At this time Gandalin and Lacindo came up in white armour befitting new knights. Lacindo went to Don Bruneo, and Gandalin toward Amadis. When Amadis saw him approach, he requested Don Quadragante to take the command while he knighted his squire. Then he went to Gandalin, and as they were going toward King Perion, said to him, My true friend, I beseech you, keep near me in this battle, for though you have seen many battles and enough of dangers, and may think that you want nothing but strength and courage, it is not so. This is a signal battle, and it behoves you to look well to your life, and to your honour also, and not to give such way to your courage as to let it master your discretion. Keep near me, and I will look to your defence when you shall need help, and do you the same by me when you see I require assistance. They were now come to where King Perion was, to whom Amadis said, Sir, Gandalin would be made a knight, and it would have pleased me that he should have been made so by your hand. But as he wishes to receive the order from me, I come to ask that he may receive the sword from you, that he may hereafter remember the great honour and by whom it was conferred. The king looked at Gandalin, and knew the horse of his son Don Galaor, and the tears came into his eyes. Friend Gandalin, said he, how did you leave Don Galaor at your departure? Greatly recovered from his malady, sir, replied the squire, but in grief and heaviness of heart, for he discovered your departure, though it was kept so secret, but not the cause. 
he besought me to tell him the truth, and I told him that by what I had learned you were gone to help King Languines of Scotland against certain neighbouring powers. I would not tell him the truth in the state wherein he is. The king, at this, heaved a sigh from his heart, loving his son dearly, and believing truly that, except Amadis, there was no better knight in the world, neither for arms nor for all the manners that became a knight. And he said, God grant, my good son, that I may never behold thy death and that I may see thee honourably freed from thy great love to King Lisuarte, that thou mayst be free and at liberty to aid thy brethren and thy lineage. Then Amadis took a sword from Durin, brother to the damsel of Denmark, and gave it to the king, and he himself knighted Gandalin, and kissed him, and put on his right spur, and King Perion fastened on his sword, and thus was he knighted, by the two best knights that ever bore arms. Amadis then went back with him to Don Quadragante, who, to do Gandalin honour, came forward and embraced him, saying, God grant, my friend, that you may as well fulfil the duties of knighthood as you have manifested all the virtues and good parts of a good squire. I believe it will be so, for good beginning for the most part bringeth on good end." Gandalin humbled himself at this, thanking him for the honour. Lacindo also was knighted by the hand of his master, and Agrius gird on his sword, and you may be assured that these twain in this their first essay of arms performed such feats and endured such dangers and such toil that they in this great battle gained honour and the praise of prowess for all the days of their lives. It was not long before they saw their enemies advancing to meet them, when they were near enough, Amadis saw that the banner of the Emperor of Rome was in the van, and at this he rejoiced, to think that the first encounter would be with him, for much as he disliked King Lisuarte, yet he always remembered how he had once dwelt in his court, and what honour he had received from him, and above all that he was the father of his Lady Oriana, for which he had resolved, if possible, to turn aside from him in the battle, that he might not harm him though he well knew that Lisuarte would show him no such courtesy, but rather seek his death as a mortal enemy. But I tell you that Agrias had a far other intention, for all his hope was that he might meet King Lisuarte in the battle and slay him. He ever bore in mind the king's ingratitude, and had he been in Mongaza when the island was given to his uncle, he could never have consented that he should receive it, having been vanquished, but would have given him another such lordship in his father's kingdom. When they were now so near that they only waited for the trumpets to sound that they might begin the attack, they saw a squire come riding full speed from the army, who inquired with a loud voice if Amadis of Gaul were there. Amadis beckoned to him in reply, and when he reproached said, I am he, what would you? The squire looked at him, and thought that in his life he had never beheld so goodly a knight in arms, nor who appeared so well on horseback. "'Good sir,' quoth he, "'of a truth I believe that you are he, for your appearance bears testimony to your great renown. Gasquilan, king of Sweden, my lord and master, sends me to tell you that when King Lisuarte made war upon your knights in the island of Mongaza, he came to his help, in the hope of engaging you in battle, not for any enmity which he bears towards you, but because of the renown of your great chivalry. And now he is come hither for the same intent, and saith that he would willingly break two or three lances with you before the armies join battle, for after that he may not be able to meet you in the tumult. Amadis replied, Good squire, tell the king your master that I have before heard of his wish, and attribute it to no enmity in him but rather to the greatness of his courage. Albeit my deeds are not equal to the fame, I am well content that the man of such renown should so esteem me. This quarrel is more of will than necessity, and I had rather it had been in some other cause, more to his own honour and profit, but I am ready to do as it may please him. Sir, replied the squire, my master knows how you conquered his father, the giant of the Dolorous Island, to save Kildadan and your brother Galaor, 
and though that is nearly concerning him, yet, because of the great courtesy wherewith you used your victory, he is more beholden to you than bound to seek revenge. It is only for your high renown that he desires to encounter you, for the victory would be to his great fame above all other knights in the world, and no shame will it be if he should be conquered by him who has conquered so many knights and giants and monsters out of nature. Tell him, quoth Amadis, that I am ready. End of Book 4, Chapter 28